and Obama have such like, you know, because he's the president who created DACA and he was also the deporter in chief, you know? And so it's like such like a, I have such a complicated feelings towards him um, because he did change my life, you know, but he was also the person in charge of, of, you know, when my community was being terrorized and deported in group big 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 amount so it's 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 such i i, I know that um it's complicated feelings towards him <laughs> hi um welcome to big rings guide to surviving i'm ann montavon and, and Maria Martinez. <laughs> this is our very special hi. guest <laughs> yeah okay. so um you actually chose this uh book and uh, do you want do you, do you actually want to give us a little bit like of an intro about who you are? Well, I am uh, an actress uh, here in LA. Um, I'm a former undocumented youth, um, and I have a very uh, deep passion for mental health. Um, currently working on um, whichever way I can to sort of expand on this. Um, to bring awareness to mental health, specifically in the undocumented community, um, through my own journey of uh, what my mental health and how my mental health has been and my experiences as an undocumented youth, um, and sort of wanting to bring awareness to these issues, as well as um, sort of destigmatizing um, the mental within my community, because I realized that's been part of the issue with why it sort of got to where I got. <laughs> So and what drew you to the book, The Undocumented Americans? Well, I had um, heard about it, I think, through, you know, Instagram or, you know, uh, just from different accounts. I follow uh, different uh, immigrant advocacy groups that I follow. And I've, I've heard about the book and um, specifically because uh, uh, I mentioned uh, she I had heard that she talks about mental health within the undocumented community um, and that's currently something that I'm I'm figuring out how how I can help you know how I can either you know uh, be a voice to it um, talk to my own community about it um, and so I wanted to read about it read about it from someone who is very educated and who has um, already published something on it and what she has to say about it and how she either talks about her own experience. I wasn't sure if it was gonna be sort of autobiographical or she was gonna you know, be talking about other people as well. And it was really interesting to see that it was a mixture of both. Um, so yeah, it basically just was specifically what I, I am currently spending my time figuring out how I can help. So I wanted to, to see how someone who's already delved into this topic was dealing with it. So what were your first thoughts about the book, like having just finished it? Um, I enjoyed it. I really felt uh, seen and heard personally. And I know she said uh, she wasn't, her focus was not to talk about dreamers, right? Um, dreamers being uh, the kids uh, like myself who were brought to this country um, as kids and, uh, you know, we, we sort of fit the sort of the, the wanting to become part of this nation through, um, our schooling, through whether joining the military or school. Um, and so she didn't, because those are the, the, the kids who usually have the spotlight, um, within the narrative and within media and who are seen as like well they're the good guys and the parents are the ones who are the villains in the story who brought these kids unknowingly and now they have so she's like I, I don't want to focus on that I want to focus on 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 the people who who are usually overlooked you know who are the day laborers who are the um you know the cleaner people who work at restaurants and um so I really personally um connected to that and I'm glad that she did that and I saw in, in reading about that, I saw a lot of what I grew up with, you know, which is my parents' struggles that are not talked about, you know, that are not, that are demonized by the media um, or can be. And, um, and seeing how, I, I just really enjoyed 
that, that she focused on that. Um, and it was very, there was parts where I had to kind of step away a little bit because it definitely brought back memories, brought back things that like, you know, are very, you know, sometimes you tuck away <laughs> for, I guess, again, for survival purposes, um, you tuck away, you put it away. And so it definitely brought up some, some stuff and some stuff that was very beautiful and very touching. And, and um, I, I think it's, it's just very honest. I can say coming from this experience, having been my experience, I can, I can, and then she's an amazing writer, so poetic in her writing, which I really, really personally appreciated. There's sort of like, uh, it, it read like a novel because of how she wrote it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I wish I had better, I wish I was as, as verbose as her <laughs> to really explain how much I, I really, uh, I really enjoyed it and I really identified with it in many ways. Yeah, I did feel um, what was interesting about it was I definitely read it and was like, oh, I want, I want films about this, you know, about these characters, mm -hmm. like where we could really delve into these stories. And it did strike me that, you know, this is why representation is so important, like genuine representation versus um, the sort of like identity politics that is only for show but like mm -hmm. actually showing the, the real lives of these people are so, you know, mm -hmm. it's such an important thing and like such a political statement because right. at first when I was read when I finished reading it or, or as I was reading it, I was a bit like thinking to myself, why is this such a big deal? Like, why is this book lauded the way it's lauded? Because it's just mm -hmm. talking about you know, people, it's just talking about mm -hmm. these people. And then when I took a step back and I thought about it, it was like, first of all, it's been touted as Obama's favorite book of something. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was kind of deeply ironic because mm -hmm. he's also known as like the deporter in chief, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was like, yeah. and then I also know that he um, excluded DACA recipients from healthcare um, in his bill as well. So I thought that was like a deeply weird, or maybe not weird, like maybe a cover up almost um, mm. in a way. But, but to get back to what I was thinking about this, I was just like, I was just like, what is remarkable about this book? You know, what mm. is remarkable about just telling stories about human beings? And then it just sort of struck me eventually that I guess what's remarkable is that it is remarkable. It's remarkable mm. to talk about people like we know that they're people and yet they've been demonized to such an extent that this book just about people who have like that are mediocre or have addiction issues or you know have dreams or have like just like normal people are it's mm -hmm. somehow like a deeply political statement to have a book about them you know because right. they're undocumented and and just the idea of someone undocumented in America is just they're always, there's always a set of stereotypes that we have or that we're given by the media about them, you know, that they have to be deserving, especially deserving. And so therefore perfect, you know? So I thought that was really, and a really interesting frame, like really interesting point of view that she did. Like she completely sidestepped all of those things, you know, by just focusing on that. So you're right, I, I thought it was like, really interestingly written what mm -hmm. what were you thinking on uh well no I was thinking similarly where it's I I will talk for white people um <laughs> no, you, can't. <laughs> you, you can't you can only I can't. talk for yourself I can't I can't <laughs> um but like oh, growing up and just um and watching everything on TV and just kind of like trying with all of the Trump supporters and different conservative, let's, let's say conservative people. Um, I feel like there's not a lot of empathy for undocumented. It's like what it, I, I feel like it's more of what are they taking away from me versus like, what are they doing for themselves? And I feel like this book 
forces you to empathize and see the people as people mm -hmm. versus like this idea of like, no, these people are coming to take away my jobs. And it's like, really, really? Like they're, they're, they're not. What are the jobs that they're eligible for? You know, and it's like, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't mind if they come into the country, but they need to do it the right way. And it's like, but it's made so hard and it's, it's near impossible to get out of their situation. So it's, it's like, what are you, what are you supposed to do? Um, and I think it was, it's wonderful accounts of what people are risking and everything that they're having to go through to have a better life for them and for their family. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, that's what I, I have to say. Find I also do like that, that she way. doesn't emphasize that part too. You know, like she doesn't try to, she doesn't at all have a context for where, where these people that she's talking about comes from. Like she doesn't talk about their political unrest or how America may be part of dismantling their specific countries. She doesn't talk about yeah. that at all. She doesn't talk yeah. about, it's like some people- I think she had like, like one sentence about it. One sentence. Cause I specifically remember her saying like, like, isn't that a hoot? Something in, and she didn't say, isn't that a hoot? But in, in reference <laughs> to like, you're, you're, that's my own interpretation of how I read that sentence. Um, you know, that, that you escaped, you know, a lot of these people are escaping um, sort of what the US has done to their country. So they're just escaping the influence from that. And it was just like a one sentence, very clean, very cut. And she kept going. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, just, yeah. Oh, yeah, I like that you pointed that, that, that out. So she is like aware of that context, but she specifically mm -hmm. decided, you know, she's not gonna discuss that. And some of the mm -hmm. reasons like for, there was that one woman in, in this book where she wanted to escape motherhood, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I thought was like, you know, it's interesting. Cause like, again, it's like, that's so, sort of frowned upon. Like yeah. motherhood, you know, is such a saintly thing, apparently. So it's just like mm -hmm. this idea where you can have whatever reason. And I think this is a really important point that she makes actually is like, you can have the best reason or the worst reason or whatever. But like, I think mm -hmm. the case that she's really making is that you're a human being. And so yeah. like the effects of the trauma that you sort of like have to experience by being undocumented, it's going to affect mm -hmm. you. And also you don't mm -hmm. deserve, like nobody deserves that sort of like inhumane treatments that right. sort of happen. So I think that's like, right. that's, it, that's, she makes such a strong case for that just by, and not, not in a um, pedantic way, but just by like explaining and not explaining, but describing really intricate details about people's lives that I mm -hmm. thought was, I thought it was really cool. Well, I just love the way she described people because it was very, you saw such a clear picture of who that exactly. person was, not just how they, they how they moved. Um, her descriptions were in the way that you felt like you knew, you know, the way when you really know someone, you, you have like, you, you identified those nuances very quickly. And again, she's so gifted in her, in the way she, she writes and speaks and expresses herself that she, she, the way she described everyone, she's like, it was just so beautiful that I was like, oh yeah, I know what she means by that. And right away, I, I was within a couple sentences, I was like, I already either feel like I know this person and it's not describing them in a way where right away you're delving into their trauma, right? It's like, right. you're going into who they are as a person because that's what we are. That's what we come with, right? Yes, like obviously we all come with baggage and trauma and everything, but there's something, there's really uh, beautiful and interesting characteristics about all of us. And I think kind of leading with that and then and then getting to know someone's story. I love the way she did that with each person. Um, and she she touched upon many people from different backgrounds right not not just day labor I love that too that she didn't just focus on like one section of the undocumented community that she was like just the farm workers or just the you know like I said the day laborers or just the you know it's like everyone from different um backgrounds and uh different sort of you know ha that, that I had that, that have had a different experience in this country you know like how how you are treated when you work in a factory 
uh, there's going to be some differences and similarities than how you are treated when you work in a restaurant or how you are treated when you have to stand in front of a Home Depot all day. And that's how you get your job. You know, how, that's how you survive this country too. That's like another thing. It's like how you survive this country, you know, the different jobs that you have to do to survive in this country. It's, it's, there's, there's different sets of problems with that. And so I like that she talked about the different people because it's true. I, I just, in my experience from seeing my parents, the different survival jobs they had to do to survive in this country, to put foot, food on the table. There was a difference. I remember when my dad was a waiter for, she talked about her dad being a waiter. And I just remember when I thought like my dad was a waiter for a few months. And I just remember that was, that was, um, a better job, so to speak, like less physically taxing and he would get tips, right? And so the sometimes like when she says about the Puerto Rican uh, executives bringing, giving her, her dad a big tip and how like to this day, she still talks about it and writes about it because it was such a big deal. And, and that just brought me back to, I was like, oh yeah, my dad did work that. And I remember the joy you get from that, you know? And, and as opposed to working in a factory for 12 hours in one day and you're back, everything, you know, so anyway, it just, it was, I, I appreciated that she, she did that, so. That's so great. Um, do you feel the same kind of ambivalence that she has around the words dreamer, you know, because she sort of yeah. doesn't like that, yeah. Right, um, you know, I don't think I, I have such, uh, and I actually, heard her in an interview or a podcast. I, can't remember. I kind of looked her up and stuff because I was like, oh, she's great. I want to be her friend. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so uh, yes, I love, I do. I, you know, she, she talked about specifically, and I don't know if she said it in this book, how the dreamer in sort of uh, literature is always sort of the, the, the character that never, like who never gets to really live out what they dream, right? So they're always stuck in sort of like, that's they always dream about it, but they never achieve it, you know. And so that's one of the reasons why she is so staunchly against that term, which I, I thought was really interesting. I've, I've never, I don't think I ever put that much thought to it, to be honest, and into the word dreamer. Um, but it has uh, being a dreamer for many years and seeing, you know, um, the ups and downs of how our emotions. So it felt like uh, Congress and the government was playing with our emotions were like the DREAM Act. And that's another reason why we're called dreamers because of the DREAM Act, um, mm-hmm. the DREAM Act, which uh, would, and again, I'm not a, I'm, think, I'm thankfully not a, a dreamer anymore. I, I was able to, you know, gain residency and all of that. But um, when I was a dreamer, just seeing like the the politics that came and, 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 and into um, the dream act getting so close to being passed more than once. And I just remember the, the, the stress and, and, and the getting our hopes up. And so I, I do get that now where it's like, you feel like you're so close and then it was like <laughs> snatched it from you. And so, so I, I, I never put thought into it the way she did, to be honest. Um, but I, I agree. And, 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 and hearing her about it, it's like, yeah, no, you're right. It always felt like we were so, did I dream that? We're really that close to finally being able to achieve this? And it's like, uh, yeah, no, yeah, you were. Because the reality is we don't care enough about your struggles. And there's like two people have, two, I think I remember one, one year it came so close. It was so close. It was like under five, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but I just remember it was so close. And just remember that whole day just being like, I'm done. Okay. I'm tapping out for the day, just emotionally, just, you know, because it's a roller coaster of emotions dealing with it. Because there's no path to citizenship from like being a DACA recipient, right? Correct. And here's the thing this was before DACA. So this was the Dream Act has been in, in, uh, had been in contention and, and, and as, used as a and that's the other thing a lot of like politicians you know even like joe biden included you know it feels we don't believe it anymore so to speak where they're like within the first hundred dates i'm gonna have and it's always you know democrat presidents i i I don't don't quote me on that but just from my experience hearing democrat presidents say within the first hundred days i will have uh you know immigration reform that will blah, blah 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 and that's how a lot of the times they get the latino vote because or the latinx vote because they they are able to get you know, a lot of, of people who have, you know, friends, family members 
who are undocumented. And so they, I feel like they pull us into that direction with those promises. And then at this point, I mean, I know I'm very jaded about it that I just don't really believe any policy. You know, I just, it's really, it's really hard for me to believe it. Um, and this was, like I said before, Doc, you were talking about Obama and Obama have such like, you know, cause he's the president who created DACA and he was also the deporter in chief, you know? And so yeah. it's like such like a, I have such a complicated feelings towards him um, cause he did change my life, you know but he was also the person in charge of, of, you know when my community was being terrorized and deported in Group big, 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 big amount. So it's 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 such. I I, I know that um, it's complicated feelings towards him. <laughs> so. Well, I think yeah. I mean, I think that's interesting too because it's just he is like that almost on every level. He has mm -hmm. like he says something or like for example, choosing this book is one of his favorite books, and then what he does is it's just there's there's a conflict between the two often, almost in every area. Of his presidency so i think right. that and i mean to an extent oh go ahead go ahead yeah no i was gonna say to an extent i know that it's 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 you know and i i, I need to read up more on it or understand it better um you know to what extent is is a congress like pushing on him for things and i you know i read michelle obama's book and i just remember her specifically saying it you know, like a lot of the times it was a lot, a lot like the, at the time when he, when he started, it was just like the Republicans were so set on going against everything he was doing that a lot of the fight was just trying to, to just like, it was so hard to get anything done. So it was like, well, to what extent is that a reason? But at the same time, I'm like, you are the president, like, can't, can't like how I, it's hard. It's really hard because it's like, obviously I'm very grateful to him. I, I was, I myself was just in a very like, I had graduated college. I was, you know, a, a dreamer. I didn't know, I'd had no prospects of becoming um, a resident or anything in this country because there was no pathway. I had just graduated from college. I had my degree, but I couldn't use it really anywhere because I didn't have the papers. And so it was just like, to me, I was like, should I just leave this country? I was very, I was, I was contemplating that idea of like, should I go back to Mexico? Should I figure out what to do there because this is it's stifling to be young and, and everyone's telling you you're so full of opportunities you just graduated from college and blah, blah, blah. and then the reality was like but I'm not and I, I was very secretive about my um, status at the time and so I, it was very hard to 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 put on that smile of like yeah yeah I'm done with college oh everything's great and inside I was like no I don't know what so when when he, and then DACA basically came in like within a year and a half or two of me having graduated from college and so that's it changed my life. So I can't deny that, but it's, 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 yeah, it's complicated. It's not easy, right? It's like, this is, it's, it's like anything in life. It's, there's so many nuances and there's so much to it. So what did DACA actually specifically do for you? Because like we're saying, mm -hmm. um, I guess this is where my ignorance is about this. Like since mm -hmm. this podcast is called Ignore Me. <laughs> 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 yeah, so it's like, uh, because I know certain things that like DACA is not a path to citizenship. DACA mm -hmm. was excluded from healthcare in terms of like you can't on DACA it was excluded from like having the ACA um, benefits as well as like Medicare or Medi-Cal all, all those types of healthcare. Mm -hmm. So what what actually did you get from DACA? Um, I got a work permit. Okay. Meant I got a social security number, um, which was. That meant I could work legally in this country, um, and I, I wasn't um, able to travel, which was uh, still a little bit of a hard hit. Meaning, like I had left my family, I, I, I wasn't able to see them. Blah blah blah. Like that's still, so you couldn't. Uh, the only way you could travel is if it was like a work reason. So, but you have to prove extensive. You had extensive paperwork to prove that it was for work purposes. Because again, it's a work permit. Um, but to me, it just it just it was, um, I gotta remember when I, I, I still remember the way you remember, like, you know, you remember really great things about your life and you really, really scared. So like I, the way I still remember not what I was doing when 9-11 happened, <laughs> um, I remember what I was doing when um, I read, like the notification came in or someone texted me or something and I read what it meant. 
and what it was going to and and just I just remember I was getting ready and then just like dropped what I was doing and I just started crying you know because I, I it was it was um it was basically part of what the dream act had promised obviously the dream act was going to put us on a path to citizenship um and residency but it felt like and it was so immediate it was like starting this year you know in a few months, it was like, I think it came out in like the spring and then by summer we could apply for it. That was the other thing. You know, we had been told, just keep waiting, keep rallying, keep fighting for this, keep doing something will come of it, something will come of it, something will come of it. And it was just like the Dream Act kept getting stalled and kept getting stalled and kept getting stopped and kept close and then pulled back. And that was, I think the year that had just gotten the closest to passing. And so, so anyway, so just the emotions were very, very high uh, for us dreamers at the time. And uh, so again, it, it might not seem like a lot to people, but to have a work permit, to be able to work legally, um, especially as a recent college graduate, to be like, oh yeah, you can now use your degree. You don't have to be in the shadows. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, was huge. And again, she talks about how as, as kids of immigrants, like are at the forefront of my mind, always, always, it's how can I help my parents because they do jobs that are very physically demanding. And I, you're always thinking about how can I take care of my parents? Cause they're gonna age out of these jobs. They're gonna age out. So to feel like my parents just sacrificed like a lot of their physical and mental and everything to get me through college. Because again, as a college student at the time, this was before DACA, so I had no, um, mm, um, what is that called, FAFSA? It's, it's so like the the uh, financial uh, help from the government, basically. I had none of that. We had none of that. It was, a, it was a very small group of us that were able to even get into college and an even smaller group that was able to finish college because we had no financial help whatsoever from anyone. And we couldn't get loans. Uh, you couldn't get because you needed a social security number. So again, getting a social security number was getting a golden ticket. It's what it felt like. I finally have, now I can apply for a loan or I can apply, I can get a car, I can get, you know, it's just the possibilities are endless. And I know it was very limiting in that it was only a two year, you had to renew every two years, but it was, you know what, I'll do it. I'll do it because I've been in the shadows for so long. I could get a driver's license now. You couldn't before, you know? The, the hoops the, that I, the things that we do <laughs> to, to stay in this country, to survive and to, um, it's insane. Um, I don't even know how much of it I can talk about, but <laughs> you know, it's, um, so it gave oh. us, it gave, it gave us a lot. Yeah. Um, Is, was there anything where, cause you know, there's, there's a lot of letdown that you've had from the government mm -hmm. and it, you know, um, when that became available to apply in the summer for DACA, was there anybody in the community who thought it was like a trap from the government that they would be deported if they applied? You know, I don't know specifically. I can't, I personally didn't think that, but I, that's a great thing you bring up because yes, there is definitely a lot of that within the community, any sort of government, anything. And now that you say it actually, I do feel like my parents had some ambivalence at first. Now that you say it, I'm like, I'm trying to remember it. Like you're bringing up some memories <laughs> of, of, I'm like, yeah, no, 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 not in a bad way. Um, uh, again, a lot of this stuff you like bury. So like little yeah. things pop up and you're like, oh yeah, I do remember that. Um, and I'm trying to remember and I, I, I want to like ask my dad now just to make sure I, I, I'm, I'm feeling like I remember him being a little like, okay, let's like, let's just make sure, let's just make sure, you know, because Again, she talks about like, it's, and it's not just the government having been a letdown before, but, uh, and you have to be very careful too. She talks about the notarios, right? Notary people who basically pose as lawyers, get thousands of dollars from a person and then they bounce and they never see them again and they don't get. So even with this, I, I didn't know what the paperwork meant. So I, I, I did know I, I, I wanted to get help from a lawyer not everyone did. Some people were very much smarter than me and figured it out on their own. But I was, I was just like, I don't want to mess this up. So I need to get a lawyer. But my parents were very like, okay, but make sure it's not a notario. Like make sure that they really are a lawyer. Make sure that they really 
have a degree <laughs> and don't just work out of, you know, a little office in the back of some place and then they just, you know, leave and you never see them again. So because we've been um, screwed over so much by both the government and within our own community, yes, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that there was many people that were, when this came out, were like, oh, you're just trying to get our address so you know where we live so that you can send ICE. I, I wouldn't doubt that, you know. Um, but it's interesting because, and she mentions this, the IRS um, has an ITIN number for us. Um, sorry, did I freeze up? Has an uh, ITIN number for us, uh, a, a individual tax identification number, which is how we pay taxes. So, so they know the government has a really good idea. And that's another thing that most people don't know is that undocumented people, most undocumented people pay taxes. My parents have been paying taxes since they've gotten here. Never, ever, ever do they get anything. You don't get anything. Even if you are owed money because you're undocumented, you're not, a, you're not uh, legally allowed to receive any of that money back, you know? Um, so uh, there's, there's people that it's interesting, like, and I'm sure there's people that didn't want to do that at, or pay for taxes through the ITIN number, again, because of that fear of, well, now ICE is going to know where I, or the government knows where I live, so can they just send ICE to me, so. Yeah, I just learned that, um, that today. I was just like, uh -huh. sort of going through YouTube, trying to see if I could gather more information, and I stumbled <laughs> upon a video about, like, undocumented um people do the vast majority do pay taxes and i couldn't mm -hmm. like it just didn't give me enough information like i was like but how you're given a number an item number but then mm -hmm. like why pay you taxes if, because you know? because again you're hoping that oh, this will have be the, the year records. Okay. Yeah, yeah to I have see. records. I, again, America, right? Like taxes are really important, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. And uh, you want to make sure that if and when there's, okay, we have a program, we're gonna, we can like, uh, you can show, okay, cool. Like the way I can show that I'm a good person and I'm an upstanding citizen and I'm a contributing citizen to this country community is that I can show I've paid taxes for 20 years. So honestly, that's, that's why we do it. You know, it is, it is terrible that like money, you're not given any money back and it does, it does take a hit, especially because you are the most vulnerable people in this country and financially and in so many other ways. And to just be like, okay, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. And you were already paid so little. <laughs> you already paid the lowest wages. You already make sure that you can't get uh, health insurance if anything happens to you. You can't get obviously disability. You can't get, you know, you can't get anything. And then on top of that, it's like, give us your money. Oh, you're owed a thousand. No, you're not getting it. Good, good day. Have a good day. You know, but again, it's, it's for that reason to show that it's like, look, I contribute to this society. I contribute to this community so it's, uh, any pathway of citizenship that's ever established. I can yeah. show that I have solid proof. So. With the pandemic, um, did you receive as a doctor recipient, um, did you receive any help or any? So actually, I am not a, a DACA recipient anymore. I ah. so I'm, I'm a resident. Yeah, so that's what I was ah, saying. Okay. Former undocumented okay. youth. Gotcha. So my guess, though, I don't. I'm not 100, and that's one of the reasons going through the pandemic as a resident. I would not have gotten through it without government help. So to me, I was like, oh my god, being undocumented. Right, and my parents are still undocumented. I, I would not have been able they completely didn't have jobs for months like nothing and they didn't they, not they had, didn't get anything right i i was oh like god no yeah i was no. reading that they don't you don't get anything if you're undocumented nothing so. nothing nothing not even yeah. a smile <laughs> so you know no you get you get nothing and my dad said had you guys and my sister and i are older and uh, the only way they were able to get through this pandemic is because we are older and we are you know my sister was born here and i i'm now a resident and could help them had we my, my dad said had this pandemic happened when you guys were both young girls I don't think we would have survived it and so my brain just went oh I get chills just thinking about it of all the people that are surviving this without any help and not just that
but the mental health toll that it's taking on their mental health, you know, the toll that it's taking on their mental health, I think is so huge that this is going to be something that's going to be affecting them for the rest of their lives. And this is going to not even going to show its signs until we're out of this really. And it's going to keep, you know, and so that's reasons why I've, I've been so like, well, what can I do? And I, and there's definitely a lot of organizations that are helping um, undocumented people with the financial part of it, which is great. Not enough, obviously not enough, but what are but organizations I, I, that uh, you're working with or that you recommend? Um, well, I know in terms of money, I'd like giving them money. I'm not, I don't want to speak to it because I'm not a hundred percent sure, but, um, I just follow, uh, I know LULAC is a good organization. Traices in Texas, uh, is great. And actually just did something with LULAC in specifically with mental health. We're going to have like, they're going to have a, I just did a mental health webinar, um, that they're going to release soon. Um, uh, Maldef also um, is another good organization, um, and um, I'm trying to think. There's, uh, I forget the specific name. I, I can send it to you guys if you want to like. Yeah, we'll put like links in the like, insert in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> in, and then also about humanity. There. Maybe you can link to your webinar. That would be cool as well. Yeah, okay. I'm, it's okay. not out yet, but whenever it comes, and it's in Spanish but I think it's going to have English subtitles. Um, and, um, and again, a lot of it is word of mouth, right? Like I know that's how my parents survived. It's you word of mouth of figuring out like, oh, you can apply like in my, there's a grant and you always have to like, there's been a couple of grants that I know have come out through uh, the local government, like through like the county, like where my parents live, the county where they live came out with some grants that I was able to apply for them. Um, and again, though, but you need, these older immigrants, like the, that, that don't have kids, a lot of them, I can imagine, like, I know, I'm just speaking from my parents' experience, my parents, so I applied to them for this grant, uh, applied to this grant for them, and, and they thankfully got it, and that's been a great help, but, but I had to do all the legwork in terms of going online, sending my email, setting this, like, my parents could not have done this, not at all, and so again, these older, like, I like that she emphasizes on these older immigrants, especially the ones who don't have kids. And she, when she talks about it, like, I want to be the kid to all of these people, because you, you know how indebted you feel to your parents and how much you want to give to them. And I just can't imagine people who don't have that support system. Cause again, like, it's so, it's so, I don't, I don't, again, I'm like, how are people surviving? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I my think parents what, a, yeah. Yeah, I think Go what ahead. the book really shows is just really it's every single problem that American society is dealing with, um, mm -hmm. undocumented, undocumented Americans, like she's saying, are the ones mm -hmm. that are really feeling the brunt of it. Like because she brings up, I mean, there's just stuff like worker rights, obviously. Mm -hmm. obviously that's going to be infecting people but also um just she brings up flint michigan and how you know yeah. and that's just something that first of all i think shouldn't be, have happened in a first world country already oh. so that's crazy right but then on top of that how is the undocumented like you're saying people who may maybe not fluent in english don't have like kids to help them they didn't mm -hmm. even know about this water situation yeah you know, so it's kind we of found like, out from relatives telling them abroad, abroad hey, exactly. did you hear, wait, what? <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that was just deeply ironic. And I think, yeah, I think that's what's interesting too about the book and about everything is that it's so, it's, I think there's this idea of like, um, in America, sort of like perpetuated by the media. It's like us, oh, not us, because I'm not American. <laughs> <laughs> Americans against you know the undocumented right it's yeah. like we were just saying there's like this fight for whatever but it's not it really isn't that way because it's just like every vulnerability in the system is reflected on every strata of society and it just hits the undocumented in a way you know that they're just like like you're saying the most vulnerable people of society and so every problem just gets, you know, they get hit with it in just a much more extreme mm -hmm. way. So. And that's why I feel too, regarding mental health, 
is so important to talk about it because a lot of it, and I can speak from experience in my communities, it's, it's, we don't talk about trauma. We don't talk about PTSD. We don't talk about, we sort of think of it that it's part of, part of the experience of being undocumented, meaning like, yeah, you're supposed to have anxiety. Yeah. You're supposed to not be able to sleep. Yeah. You're supposed like, that's what, it, you know, like it's part of the, the game plan and it's, it hits us and, 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 and you, the longer you don't address it, the bigger it gets, the bigger the monster becomes. And the more you think that it's, you're supposed to be fighting this big monster. Yeah. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. That's what it means to be an immigrant. And it's like, no, it doesn't have to be like that. There, there, there are ways to combat it. There are ways to do there, there should be help for you, but there isn't. And so that's, it's, it's, it's not talked about for many different reasons, you know, cause you're, you're supposed to, it's almost like a badge of honor to go through this experience and survive it and, and to go through it and, and survive all aspects of it, not just the physical heart, physical labor, but the heart emotional um, repercussions from it and to, and to not talk, it's, it's almost like not talked about in a, in a way that it's, that, Hey, it's mental health. You know, like you, when people think of mental health, they're talking to a therapist or talking, they think it's, it's what it's rich people do. And right. then there's a stigma or it's something that, that that's what rich people do. They have the money and the time to just, and I get it. It is very expensive and there's not a lot of programs that, you I mean, know, but it shouldn't access. be. I mean, that it that's shouldn't the thing. be. You should have universal health care that includes mental health care. I mean, that right. just it makes no sense. And and also right. I think it it just perpetuates this idea. It's it's exactly what you're saying. It perpetuates this idea that if you're an undocumented person, you're somehow more virtuous, <laughs> like you know, more immune to like trauma. Mm -hmm. You're just more hardworking, just naturally, everything. You're more mm -hmm. of like perfect in a way and then on top of that you should be more grateful you know so it's kind of this weird versus if you're human all these experiences are going to affect you and they're going to affect your wellness they're going to affect your mental health mm -hmm. like trauma will affect you because you're human so well, it's we just... don't even think call it trauma that's the other problem we don't think to even call it trauma but yeah sorry go ahead but I mean I think yeah exactly you don't call it trauma um there's not this sense of that we that that people just in general have the right to health care it's like it's like mental health care it's like it's only for rich people <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. only you know and it's it's just part of the bigger problems i think in the u.s this sort of yeah. attitude um but how so how do you what do you do when you're um um trying to do your outreach to these um i'll be honest and i just basically a like have sort of started this and coronavirus has complicated a lot of things in terms of what outreach means um so you know right now I, I my first thing was to reach out to nonprofits, kind of some of the ones I named earlier and to say like like hi like this is my experience this is my outlook this is a problem I have I want to put in the work and time to 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 start addressing it so what can I do? And so, you know, it's definitely just reaching out to people that have a wider reach than me, right? And my opinion was like, let me reach out to the people that already have an audience of Latinx undocumented people that can maybe make, amplify my voice in this subject. And so, like I said, so Black was one of the organizations that got back to me. And so I, I did this webinar and sort of my next step now, um, I want to, um, and I have friends who are I have a friend, one friend specifically, who's a community organizer and who knows other community organizers. And my next goal is to um, go out and talk to people. Um, and I, I want to implement a mental health program. That's my goal. And again, it, it's going to come and it's very much in the baby steps right now because it's, it needs money. And I have, I have, um, I was able, I have a bilingual therapist that I know would be willing to help me with this, but now I need, so now I'm working on, on getting the funding and, and making sure that I'm have people who would want to take this. Cause that's the other part of the quote unquote issue. Right. Um, like for me personally, it took me a long time to finally like, Oh no, I need therapy. I kept thinking like, I can fight this off. I can fight this off. 
oh, I can't get out of bed today. Oh, anxiety is crippling me today, but it's, I can fight this off. I can fight this off. It's just put one step foot forward. And, and, you know, you, you're stronger than this. You're mentally strong. So you can do it. You can do it. And it took me going to a really low, low to then go like, oh, look, I I need to go to therapy (laughs) just to survive through my day. And this was after I was, I was already a resident and, and just mentally things got really bad that I had to, I had to do it. But um, so just, I'm, I'm still brainstorming on how to have a community outreach. And I feel like the more, the little like baby so I have this webinar and then I'm, I'm planning on, I have a friend who's a documentary filmmaker, who's going to hopefully help me come up with a video, whether it's going to be a GoFundMe or, so I'm, I'm working on little things that I hope will add credibility to my voice which is basically the main step right now to then, so I can expand and reach out to more people who have, a, again, a wider, farther reach than I do. Community organizers, um, there's, you know, um, activists that I follow on uh, Instagram who I've reached out to, but I haven't heard anything from, and I get it, they probably get flooded with things. So I'm figuring out how to gain more uh, things, whether it's like, look, I have this webinar, and then I have this video and then I have, I've provided mental health services for these many people, even if it's a small number, but how can you help me like broaden this? So I just wanna like show that I'm serious about this first and have some sort of things already that are tangible that I can come, you know, under my belt and say, this is what I have to offer. So how can you help me expand this? So and what, again, I'm figuring you're... this out as I go along. <laughs> so it's, I don't know, I could be doing it wrong. I don't know. <laughs> you're doing really, it I really <laughs> doubt you're doing it wrong yeah, like yeah. what so what sort of when you say mental health services what are you specifically mm-hmm. talking about and you know uh, for me right now I'm talking about therapy so that's where I want to start because therapy for me helped me a lot and and I was able to do it for a year and a lot of the things that I learned from that have even got me through the pandemic you know a lot of the tools that I learned in that helped me understand helped me get through it mentally through the pandemic and I just remember thinking it's like well not everyone has access to that not everyone has the ability to do that for themselves so yes therapy is one of the things but I know that therapy might not be the thing for everyone too but so right? does this so, mean that you have like um a list of therapists that you can sort of help people to okay so like bilingual mm-hmm. therapists that you can mm-hmm. Okay. And the thing That's is awesome. right now too, because of the pandemic, obviously it'd be through Zoom. Um, so that's the other thing. It's like, no, well, not everyone has access to, it's, uh, there's definitely like, I have a list of things internet. that I have to figure out. Yeah. And so I got to figure out with a the therapist too, like, well, would you be able to do phone calls? And, you know, so um, figuring out the logistics of it too. And who would be it? Because again, like, I can't expect for me to come to a community and say, hi guys, I have you know, would you like a month of free therapy? Cause that's all I can afford right now. And, and, uh, but I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if people were like, no, nah, I'm good. And could still, you know, and, 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 and could be, you know, entrenched in, in anxiety, depression, you know, all these problems and still be like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And I get that. So like the other part of it is like, how do I broaden the conversation I, again? Like I want to us to talk about it and to even, if we even want, even just sharing, like, these are the things that I do to ground me, whether it's, I write three things that I'm grateful for every day. I meditate, I do yoga, you know, like the little things that help me get through my day um, mentally. And even in just sharing those, those kinds of, we starting out with that, but just having people even listen to that and, and eventually, yeah. So for me right now, it's therapy. That's what I think. But again, I, I, I'm learning as I go along and I know that's not going to be the solution for everyone. So if we could even just start with the conversation and having it and talking to your kids about it and your parents, cause it was a very awkward conversation for my parents and I, when I went to therapy, very awkward, a lot of, uh, weird feelings, a lot of like, but we've done everything for you what do you mean you need to see a therapist? A lot of guilt. And it's another thing that like, and then when I did go to therapy, my mom being like, how are you doing today? You know, like not because her thinking that like, she needed to be very like, oh no, 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 I can't, I can't, but it, it, and, but, and so I wanted, I want to have conversations because if, if kids do go to therapy and the parents, I don't want 
I want to have a conversation. What does it feel like? Do you, you feel betrayed by that? Do you feel the kids feel guilty? Like it's, it's just such a huge overlooked conversation topic that's been overlooked for years and decades and we don't talk about it and just I'm just again speaking from my experience I'm sure there's people who do and who but from my experience it's it's it makes it harder to take care of your mental health when you feel like you're betraying your family for doing it so that's another thing that the author Carla also talks about um survivor's guilt um yes which I think is what I have right now being a resident um you know you get to a point in your life where I'm like oh, I don't, I don't have to be scared about deportation anymore. But every, people that I love still are. And so what do, can I do? Like, I have to do something big and related to her. I mean, like, I have to be astronomically, astronomically, you know, successful in order to properly give back the way I deserve or the way my parents deserve to be treat it you know to make up for all the mistreatment to make up for all the times that or you know someone was racist or gave them an injustice or all the dehumanizing things they've left through all this life like I have to be so successful to sort of patch that up in a way and then you can't help but but think about everyone else people that you haven't met and so I love the way she said like I am your daughter like I I because I I felt that so because that's how I know that's how I feel I can't help and go anywhere and see an older person who's working who I I sometimes even if they're not undocumented I'm like or they you know like and I think of my dad and I think of my mom and I think of people that I grew up with and just to think like I can't help but feel indebted to those those people too that are struggling in any any which way and 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 I may yeah I think it is survivor's guild and and but I want to you just feel like indebted to all of it and you you feel like you're the one who made it. And so it's like, if I made it out, it's for a reason and it would be completely wasted on me if I don't give back in whichever way that I can in astronomically ways, you know? So yeah, I related to that hardcore. <laughs> and again, that kind of in a way takes a toll on your mental health because putting that kind of pressure on yourself feeling like you have to be the savior for your family that's a lot of pressure it's a lot of pressure so it's it's mitigating those feelings of like I made it out I had to save everyone with like hold on hold on but like can you and like what is the step you can take that because you can't do it in one day because now the next day you're depressed because you didn't do it yesterday (laughs) you know so it's like it's it's still figuring out what that means and taking care of myself mentally so that I can actually do that for hopefully others you know The Ignoramus's Guide to Surviving Humanity is available as a podcast on Spotify and Amazon Music You can also like and subscribe to our videos on YouTube. And if you want to help us grow, then you can become a patron on Patreon. And that's it, right? I think that's That's it. it. Yeah. (laughs)